Okay, folks, we are, we are past-ish. We are way-ish. We might be accused of being Jew-ish. <laughs> he's in the back. He's, he's in the hallway, okay. Todd, it's all yours, sir. Okay, folks. Well, here we are, seated in heavenly places, in Yeshua, Messiah. Thank you very much. And uh, our chance to rehearse the time when we will be face to face. Turn to page 148, if you would. Is everybody supposed to stand? I don't know. says to the congregation, Paul says, quit yourself like a man. <laughs> I don't think he was just talking to the men. That would have been embarrassing. So please open uh, the congregation in prayer. Merciful Father who is in heaven, 
God, we just ask that you take charge of this service today. God bless the speakers today. Also the music that's being presented before your ears, Lord. Let it be a sweet aroma unto you, Father. God, let everything we do today be pleasing in your sight, Father, and to glorify you and to be for the edification of our brothers and our sisters present here. God, we are on day four, and when I get to this point, it kind of breaks my heart because I know we're midway in of your plan. God, I give you thanks for everything that you have done here so far. Lord, the love that's being spread around is just amazing. God, I just ask again that you just keep your hedge of protection around all the little children that is presented here today, Father. Yes. For when they are worthy and we know without a shadow of a doubt, God, that you love them and you're going to be present in their lives and in their walk with you. God, we just ask now that you take charge. Let things go as you have your will for it, Father. Just let it lead in the way you want it to be and let the words, Father, let our ears hearken into the words that are going to be presented today by Mr. Daniels, Father. And we give you glory and honor and strength, Father, that you called us out. In faith, hope, and love, Father, I pray through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. Don't turn it off. You're going to give me hope. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Setting the tone for the whole service. So I thank you for that, Darla. And if you would all turn to, well, I guess you don't need to. <laughs> I'm thinking everybody has a book like me. <laughs> By next year, I should have all the hymns memorized. And 114, 114 for those of you who do have books and who are literate. So that's uh, nothing but the blood. <laughs>
Oh, I turned right to it. Wow. wow. Okay, well, we'll, t we'll take that as a sign. Page nine. These lyrics are taken from Revelation chapter 19. special treat with the children's choir, I think it is.
Yeah, no. Now we have a scripture reading. Krista is going to read for us. So Roger might regret asking me to do this. No, I'm okay. Basically, words are like my version of a paint and brush for like masterpiece. So sorry, Roger. It's all your fault. <laughs> all right. So we're going to start Second Corinthians 4, 15 to 16. And there's going to be a couple, so don't feel bad if you can't keep up. <laughs> Second Corinthians, so for all of the things are for your sakes, that the grace being multiplied through the many may cause the thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we don't faint, but though our outward person is decaying, yet our inward person is renewed day by day. So I'm going to look down a lot so I don't start crying. <laughs> I've had a life that people call living soap opera <laughs> or have called me broken or damaged goods. So short version, my brother was murdered by a drunk driver when I was little. The man got away with it because he was a blue blood or a badge brother. I don't hate police. I have many family members that are, but there's bad ones as well as good ones. Throughout my life, I've had broken bones, ribs were the worst. I have survived second and third degree burns at 13. I gave natural birth to my child, who I wasn't ever supposed to have, for 29 hours and 32 minutes, all natural. And he was crowned for three and a half hours of that, if any of you women remember that thing. But nothing bad happened to him or me. I lost my mother to lymphoma and kidney failure on the last great day, the first feast I ever missed seven years ago this year had complete shoulder repair surgery from lifting her to help take care of her, but I continued working as an LMT, not realizing the damage that I'd done. So pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, it's not a mystery to me, but until I landed flat in a hospital bed, not allowed to move or sit up with part of my spine taken out to save my life from a tumor inside my spinal cord. This scripture never made sense to me until then. And that's 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. Concerning this thing, I begged the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses and in injuries and necessities and persecutions and in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Some say that I'm cursed <laughs> or haunted by demons because of the hell my family's been through, the hell that I've lived through. But that's where Second Thessalonians 3.3 hops out. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Joshua 1.9 has been a favorite for a long time. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed, for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. I found this next scripture jumping out two weeks before the tumor made itself known, taking out my legs. And I know it was January 10th, 2020, because I tagged it and bookmarked it in every app in my phone and iPad, my Bibles with dates on their bookmarks. My legs started going numb at work on Wednesday, the 22nd, 2020. That's when I landed in the hospital. So where Psalm 73, 26 comes out, my flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Many asked and still ask honestly why I'm not angry at God or blame Christ, turn away and lose my faith. I mostly get frustrated and Definitely distraught with my body not being my body anymore. But with the consistent pain that is barely dulled by prescription beds and essential oils of his own created earth, I trust me, definitely have had anger at first and even with my body on occasion, especially when COVID shut down hospital and took my family away from me after already being in there for a month and a half and I was stuck there for three more weeks alone. The nurses definitely got earfuls. <laughs> and they had me on enough steroids that I could have like become the Hulk. So I tell him 
What's utterly absurd about this still, and I did then, I boss him around about what should be better by now and it's unfair. Especially since he, you know, bothered to save me and I, you know, keep my life here and all that jazz. So my trick is not holding it in. Not letting it fester and getting angry. My words are my art. But it's also an asking for the why so I can understand and process it and accepting when I hear it what he's already told us. So Jeremiah 29, 11 to 12. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says Yahweh the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you hope and a future. You shall call on me and you shall go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Isaiah 41, 9 to 10. You whom I have taken hold of from the ends of the earth and called from its corners and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I know many people in here have stories from backgrounds of lives like mine. We are living soap operas, and it's because we live in the fire. We have to to get through to be his people. This was mostly from the World English Bible, but this one's from the Amplified Bible. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. In Psalms 147.3. In 2 Corinthians, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Or in my case, I roll by faith, not with legs this tall. Thank you. Sorry, Roger. session. <laughs> uh, announcement. Once we confirm that it is from the index that it is indeed, this is my father's world? Okay. 150? Oh. 
Boy, when, you know, when you reach this stage in the feast, and I am not the one to bring it up, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not the one to tell everybody, by the way, folks, we're halfway through. <laughs> it was brought up this morning, and I'm like, oh, that's right. Oh, man. Well, in a way, it's like, wow, what a bummer. We're already halfway through this. We don't want it to end. And we're looking forward to that time where we'll never, ever have to say goodbye to go back out into that. Because we're going into something that's going to be eternal. And that's what this whole feast is building up to. We'll talk more about that on the last day. But what we're doing here together today is this big build up. This thousand year millennial reign of our Lord and Savior Yeshua Christ the King. Those of us that are with him. We are going to be working to prepare this earth. For the greatest thing that has ever happened in existence. That everyone who is asleep is coming up. And we will have a role in handling that and helping those that are uh, alive at that time uh, in the flesh of our, of our Savior's rule to say, this is the way, walk in it. We'll be able, we will be able to take everything we're learning right now that you're absorbing and you're understanding your study. We're going to actually have to learn how to apply that in, in a direct manner. And that's what we're all, we're all able, going to be able to do. And this is this great exercise we have. So we're looking forward to that. So yes, we have announcements uh, today. Um, this, this uh, situation that kind of came up was addressed a little bit earlier, but I'll address it to the whole congregation. Um, we're, if you've noticed, we're moving some of the comfortable chairs further up. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because the acoustics in this room, which is nice, are horrible for sound. The sound bounces all over. So any whispering or murmuring or commenting or uh, the, you know kids being kids, uh, anyone sitting in the back has difficulty hearing, especially I know our elderly already are having hearing issues. So we would request for the elderly to please come forward, sit closer to the speaker here, and what will happen is uh, the din of conversation or moms and dads telling their kids to quiet down won't be, it won't be so difficult for you to hear the speaker up front here. So uh, if you want to hear better, uh, and see the faces and that might help you uh, hear the words being spoken. Just come up. Don't be shy. We don't bite hard. Just come on up and sit close and uh, we'll have uh, the younger kids and uh, sit further back. But just as a reminder, a little bit of din if you talk and make comments and I, I'm guilty of this because the scripture will be mentioned or a comment will be made and I have to turn to my wife and say, yeah, hey, uh, you know, I, I heard that last week and here's what I got out of it. And then you realize in this hall, the people behind you are hearing everything you're saying, and it can interrupt. And that's just because of the acoustics here. It's not really a, a sound hall, so just um, bring that to your attention. The other announcement I have to make that's uh, to today is we are under a red flag warning here. What that means is that fire conditions, we've been in a drought. We had a little sprinkling yesterday while we were barbecuing <laughs> at the picnic. <laughs> It opened up right over the grill, right, Roger? <laughs> Joe, Roger, and myself were just sitting under this deluge. Fire kept putting, uh, the, the rain kept putting the, the coals out. But it was real brief. It didn't last long. You know, we had sunshine by the time we were about done eating. We should have prayed. Yeah, we did. Oh, trust me, we prayed. But there's that word that my grace is sufficient for you. Be thankful you're together. It's not all about you because there are farmers desperate for some rain and anybody that owns a field, anyone that owns livestock, 
was so grateful for what happened. It's not all about us. Even though we like to think it is, it's, it's not all about us here in this room. It's about ev everything. That's what our Father's mindset's on. But there is a red flag warning. We're supposed to have 20 to 30 mile an hour winds today until about 8 p.m. tonight. The reason I'm mentioning it is we have a uh, campfire s'mores and fellowship scheduled. If it's still windy, when they're under a red flag warning, no fires outside. Because one ember can land and you get a rapid spreading fire. And uh, we don't want anyone getting in trouble from the uh, uh, DNR out here because they'll be very strict during a red flag warning. So, uh, yes, also for your cabins, please. If it's still windy tonight, you want to light a campfire, please refrain. If it's calm outside, that's a different story. Okay, yeah, they're, they're, and it may be extended into tomorrow. If you're not sure, find one of us, and, and we'll know, or check, you can even check, maybe the front office would know. But I have a, a weather alert radio and all that on my phone, so we're under the red flag warning at the moment till 8 p.m. If that's extended, I'll make another announcement a little bit later if it's going to go in tomorrow. Okay, but I guess for today, let's refrain from campfire, but, but, because more importantly than having a campfire is having the fire of the Spirit, and we were going to just get together and fellowship and sing uh, songs together or whatever the Spirit lets us to do. We will do that anyway. We just won't have a roaring campfire. And I don't know if we'll do it out, outside or if we'll do it in here. I'll leave that up to Bernard and crew because they're the ones with the instruments that lead us and we'll decide that. But we are fellowshipping tonight. Uh, but the other thing we're doing um, today, we're going down the list here. This afternoon uh, from 3 to 5 p.m., uh, Regina and Todd... Uh, are giving a great seminar that my nephew is he's leaving work early to come to your seminar wow. he's all excited about it and it's uh, a seminar uh, titled as it was in the days of Noah and that ought to be really good so we're looking forward to that that's from 3 to 5 and uh, sometime shortly after 5 we're going to have to break it all down and set the tables up um, because the Browers in the Halls are cooking Thanksgiving supper for all of us. Tur turkey and dressing and all the fixings. And we're having that tonight uh, from six-ish, ish especially because she's trying to get so many things going. It will be ish, but sometime after six, come on down here with your appetites and we'll all have Thanksgiving supper together uh, this evening, which followed by just fellowship, sing along out back or here in the hall if it's nice out. So we'll do that. And uh, tomorrow's seminar uh, is part two of what we started today, uh, the panel discussion on a woman's role in church. And boy, at the end there, we really got rolling in the conversation, <laughs> didn't we? Everybody, so we're going to do part two tomorrow. We'll have more opportunity to actually uh, have more op of an open discussion together. And that was very lively today. And we'll do that again tomorrow, part two. Um, and then tomorrow, we're serving lunch. My niece is coming, and we are catering Fiesta Friday. So if you like South of the Border Fair or Puerto Rican Fair, uh, we'll have a whole spread for lunch uh, tomorrow. And then um, tomorrow afternoon from 2.30 to 4 is uh, uh, games and activities that my wife's in charge of. Minute to win, it. Minute to win it games with prizes. And then uh, tomorrow night, our, spe our speaker today, uh, Mr. Leon Dan, my buddy Leon. Yeah, he's doing a Bible study. In here tomorrow evening from 7 to 8 30 ish ish whenever uh, he, he goes we're gonna have a Bible study and he's gonna delve into Luke chapter 6 24 through 26 so that'll be tomorrow evening and uh, that's it you don't have to sit there and stare at, at me for the rest of the day that's all the announcements I have uh, we'll have more tomorrow and hopefully it'll be less and less and less and uh, we have another song. Or Todd we, and Regina, special music. Todd and Regina have special music for us. Before we are uh, treated to my buddy Leon Daniels as a sermon. Well, we have a third song by. Marty Gitz and Jennifer Gitz, his wife. There is a chorus in this that you can possibly chime in on. It goes, Oh Lord, our Lord, 
How excellent is your name in all of the earth. Yahweh, how excellent is your name. So, you know, if you can come in, that would help the song immensely. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you
because I don't think that's going to work. Uh, they would evaluate me at the club and said I was too uh, Baptist, I think. Well, I, said, uh, I said, that makes sense since I was raised in a Baptist environment. I am who I am. And I don't think God's worried about me having a big mouth. I think he gave it to me. Today we're going to talk about a relationship that most people are very seldom talk. You don't have to take notes because I have, I'm going to pass them. In a few minutes they're going to pass these things around. And, uh, and I hope everybody get one because I don't know how many people, I didn't make but 50. But I, the couples can share, I think. In the following examples that I'm going to read, it speaks of Jesus as being the bridegroom and the disciples. The light getting again. Okay, I got it. It's good. It's good. It speaks. It speaks as Jesus as being the bridegroom and the disciples as being his friends. I'm going to read first from Mark the ninth chapter, verse fourteen. And I'm going to warn you. I have tried to get the mistakes out of that thing. <laughs> But you guys are smart enough to look over. Baptist the, the ninth chapter, verse 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we the, and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the friend of the bridegroom long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom should be taken from them, and they should fast. Now most people read that, they think about fasting. But I'm reading this with one thing in mind and another. He called the disciples the friend of the bridegroom, and not the bride. He called dead John the Baptist in verse John chapter three, Verse 29, John the Baptist was a friend of the bridegroom, but he was not the bride. And this is what it says. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands here, stands and hear him, rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This may, this is my joy, therefore is filled, fulfilled. Even when you closely examine the parable of the virgin, you will see some that say that most translation, this translation, I'm going to get to it in a minute, but, and you can go and check with a phone now, you can see it right quick. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto, unto ten virgins, who took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were spies, and five were foolish. And they, were, they that were foolish took their lambs and, and took no oil with them. They sort of got disconnected from the vine. For some reason, they were going through the motion. They were with the congregation, but they really weren't there. And you remember that Jesus said that he was going to let the tar and the wheat stay together, and he was going to divide them. So if you got a church that got all righteous people in it, you better look at the, the, the other half because there might be something wrong. One of the problems I had when I was about 40 or 50 was I was looking for the church. I wanted to find the church. I have cried like a baby because of the pain I felt because a man was mistreating me under the banner of the, this, I, this is, I'm the church. I cried. I was moving from Ohio and I went home. I was still sleeping on the floor because I would get my house ready for my wife to come. I was, had to go and get her in a month. I had had a job that I couldn't resist that, and then and, and, and it played out on me that I had to come back begging for my old job. I said, teaching humility. But anyway, when I was looking for this church, the church was going crazy in the 90s. 
My daughter had brought me a mattress, so I, I, I just lied down there and picked up the Bible. First thing I picked up was John, the fourth chapter, verses 21 through 24. God of spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Oh, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. The time is coming and there is. You don't have to go in the mountain. God is looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So from that day on, I find, I didn't know about these other scriptures where Paul said, go to the throne, go only to the throne of God. I didn't know about those scriptures. But now I know the reason you don't find a perfect church on earth is because there's not any. We are here to encourage each other. That's what we not to beat each other up. When you talk about the love chapter, you know the love chapter starts with your your wife, your children, and it starts with the church. I don't I mean I don't have to practice patience and long suffering with a Chinese person in China. An African guy in the village in Africa. I'm not around him. This is where I got to practice right here. You got to practice with me. I know I got faults. I'm so I'm sorry, but to get in the kingdom, you're gonna have to forgive. I'm gonna have to forgive you. God is teaching us how to be leaders in the wonderful world tomorrow. And He's not He's not telling us to beat people up. He's telling us how to learn to be patient and long-suffering with the people. And guess what he's doing with us? That's exactly what he's doing with us. I'm going to pick it up in verse 4. I don't know where I stopped. Uh, let me start at verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slung and slept, and at midnight, there was a cry. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil. For lamps, for our lamps are gone out. They did stay connected to the vine, to the salt. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Let them be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they were, went to buy, the bridegroom came. They were ready, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage. King James is the only one that said marriage by itself. Every other translation you know, says either the. Uh, Supper or a banquet. They was invited. They was invited guests. That's important to know because we're gonna enjoy that great gathering that we're gonna have in the city of my Lord, the dwelling place for eternity, New Jerusalem. And we're going to get to that. It's in there. If y'all don't get ahead, I mean, you'll read it before. I got a little ahead of myself. Let me get back up here to where I was. I took my notes off before I finished. <laughs> And the wife, okay, let me drop down. And, the, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they had, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And I got notes down there because I looked it up. Wedding, supper, or banquet. And the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. It's interesting that he called them virgins. That means they had a sense of purity, but something was lacking. And I think he tells us what it is. After was, came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Virgin, I say to you, unto you, I know you not. 
Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man comes. It, it really, the, the moral of that particular parable is to be ready. That's what it's talking about. But I'm picking a particular thing out because I want you to see that these people was not the bride. They was invited to. So, and I know that's what, I didn't want to give this speech. I prayed and said, God, you know, Michael does a pretty good job. Give it to him. I thought of everybody. I would have resurrected God and tell anybody. <laughs> I, I, I said, God, I'm not qualified. I'm not jumping down and turn flip guy. I don't know about all this technical stuff. That's why I printed all that stuff. Because I wanted you to be able to see it because I didn't think I could do a good job of, of, of delivering it. And that's why I did it. And this is because this is controversial in our environment. I knew it. I've been knowing it. The one wearing the correct clothes, clothing were invited to the wedding feast as guests and were not the bride. And we see the same thing in Matthew's the 22nd chapter. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who make a marriage for his son. The king is preparing this waiting for his son. The king is doing it. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would come not. He's basically talking about Israel and this time probably the Jews more than Israel because Israel was already gone out of sight. And they would not come. Again he went and he sent forth other servants saying, tell them who are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. Who prepared this dinner? It was God preparing it for his son. My oxygen, as he just said, he said, Man, my oxygen and my fattening and my killings and kill, are killed and all things are ready. Now notice what he's saying now. He, he's getting it ready. The father getting the marriage ready. Come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way. One to the farm, another to the, his merchants, and he and the remnant to his servants and treated them shamefully and slew them. You know, Jesus said that the father of the Jews during his time, they killed the prophets. Yeah. That's what Jesus said, I didn't say it. But, but then, but when the king heard thereof, he was angry. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burn up their cities. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they who were bidden was not worthy. So then he said, go you therefore into the highways as many as you shall find, be it to the marriage. So that the servants went out to the highways and gathered together, many as, as they found, both bad and good. That's how I got here. They, when they found, they, 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 they went to Chelsea. They <laughs> said, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there was a man there. This is another important point he wanted to bring out that you have to have the proper clothing on. You have to have the proper clothing. So when this one, that's really, and so the servant went into the highways and gathered together. Many of them found both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came, he saw, let me go back again, because I want to emphasize something here. The wedding was furnished with guests. The king threw a party. The God said, I'm going to go a party for my son. And he invited you to the party. To, to, he didn't invite you as the guests. And I, I mean, you got all the scriptures, you can read your own Bible, because I don't tell no stories. I made a bad grade 
in school because the guy asked me to give him my personal philosophy of life. I said, I don't have one. I gave it up 20 years ago. That was in 1990. I was in a theology school. I made a bad grade in theology. <laughs> I said, oh, I did good. And when the king came into the seat of the guests, he saw the man who had no, on no wedding garment. He had the wrong stuff on it. He said unto them, friends, now come, you in here not having the wedding garment on. And he was speechless. So then he told, you know what happened. He told, he ran them out and all that. But at the end of this, he says, many are called, but a few are chosen. That's the point he breaking. And then that, with the guy having the wrong clothes on, we don't know the guy, the guy fooled us. He might have been the pastor of the church. But when God saw Jesus, saw the, the, he said, no, you know the guy, you're not dressed right, something wrong here. So what he's looking for is different than what we look for. Amen. Yeah. So we thought the guy was all right. But, so we don't know. We have to love everybody, whether they're good or bad. We have to treat them like they're the most important brother in the world. We have to treat them with love. If you read Revelation, the 19th the chapter, verses 7 through 9, it saw the parallels with Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 1 and 14. The call and the chosen are guests at the wedding, they're not the bride. And we're going to read that. The reason I gave you that paper is because I'm going back and forth. And I wanted you to go back and see the scriptures that parallel. I want you to, I want you to see it. Let's read here, Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse seven. Let's be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife made herself ready. There's no scripture that backs up to support that. that the, the scripture that will support that is that God prepared, because the sin, the bad I'm talking about is not us. And, and we'll find that out. And I know this is not, you have to realize, I've been, I got on this, I think, I looked it up last night. I started on this January the 4th, 19, uh, 2015. And I, you know, then I, Sent it to the pastor. He called me, told me crazy, I was crazy. I talked to the deacon. He told me I was crazy. And so, y'all listen to a crazy man. <laughs> Let's be glad to rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. This actually corresponds with Matthew 22, verses 2, 8, and 10. And you can saw the glance up there. See what I got it underlined and then I tell it. Verse 8, to him was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linens, clean and white. For the linens is the righteous acts of the saints. And this, we, it been explained in the other scriptures. I got that kind of wrong, but the what well, we know now that it's the righteous clothes, the clothes of the saints, it's the, the right garment. They parallel. Then if you read Revelation 19, chapter verse 9, and he, he tells you right there what he's looking for. I got it highlighted. He said to me, right, and blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. We're going to find, this is just laying the foundation for the sermon. Y'all not getting to the sermon yet. This is, I couldn't do the sermon unless I covered this. I wish I could have, but I couldn't. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. And as I said, this compares with Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 10. The call represents the guests at the wedding. They are not the bride. 
Now, being a research guy, I worked in research for about 30 years, 25 years. You say, well, I want to get, the, let's look at the other side of this. You, you give me your bias, let's look at what the other people said. So I'm uh, trying to be fair. I uh, looked at the other scripture. I looked at Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verse 32. And I'm paraphrasing this. You can go back and read the scripture. We know the Lord said he was a husband to Israel. That's what he said. He was a husband to Israel. And the word husband used there, you got the papers, the strong concordance, 1166. It actually means, it means master or ruler. And we got the historical reason Sometimes he didn't use Lord because Bell had messed it up so bad, he used the word husband. But in the Old Testament, the word husband was interchangeable. It was no different than Lord or Master. If you think, Abraham's wife called him my Lord. That is the truth. We have, do not understand one basic proof, truth is a woman could not get a divorce in the Jewish culture. Only the man could write the woman a certificate of divorce. A woman would never use the spirit, the expression I'm married. The husband would use it. The word, she wouldn't use it. This is the, this is the Bible. So when in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and Paul is talking about the relationship between the church and the head of the church. If Jesus was the master, Lord of Israel, basically, he, he's, that's what the man is in the family. He's the head of the family. I know the new morality says that's not true. And my wife didn't like it either, but that's what, but I never stopped saying it. And she said she got tired of this story, I guess. Jeremiah the 13, chapter, verse 14. The Lord said, I'll marry to you, speaking of Israel. And look up the word itself. It means master, ruler. It's always the head, I guarantee you that. Cat, God used the expression that he was married to a city. He does, he does it right here. And Isaiah the 62, 60, uh, 62 chapter, verse 1 For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For, Jews, for Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like, like, like the dawn, and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nation will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, and the mouth of the Lord has restored. He restored. You will be crowned splendid in the Lord's hand, and the Lord dying, died them in the hands of your God. No longer will they call you deserted, a name you desolate, but you will be called Hesabah, and your name Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. A young man, a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoice over the bride, so will your God rejoice over you. That is from the King, from the New Revised Version. I, I went and repeated that under the under the, the King James Version because I wanted to use the concordance. And it says the same thing, but if you look up the word sons here, it means that the son is a builder of the family name. He's the one that builder of the family name. That's, that's what it means. Now I said all of that three pages to lay the foundation. Michael alluded to it. We all are here for one reason. 
you know, I tried to be a, like a college professor there, that's not me. So, <laughs> I am a, I don't know, you know, I don't know what I am. <laughs> Revelation 19.7 is speaking of an event that takes place in heaven before Christ's return. This is one of the greatest happenings since the creation of the heaven and earth. Revelation 19.15, he would rule them with a rod of iron and himself would dread out the wine press. This is the acclamation praise in the Hebrew Psalms was important in Jewish literary, can say the word liturgy. <laughs> and, uh, then, and then it goes on to say, the wedding the day of the Lamb, symbol of God's reign, about ready to begin. Most people, when they read that, they read 1907, they never read the whole thing. If you read the whole thing, starting off from the first, there's a celebration! The God, y'all got the papers, so I don't have to read that. I'm just going to start talking. Now I'm going to tell you what my version of what it says there. If you start reading the first, the first chapter, verse nine, the first verse, the first 19, you see that that's going to be a gathering of everything, somebody's great event. You just read it. I mean, it, this is a great event. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of angels are there. They, 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 I mean, this is a big celebration. There's something about ready to happen. I don't get amazed that I quoted something from the Catholic. I believe in studying all things, holding fast that which is good. And by the way, about 25 or 30% of what I know, I think I know, it came from a woman. She used to call me 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and I had to go to work that day and she didn't work. And since she'll go sleep on the phone while I'm talking to her, and I'm the one that had to get, you know, got woke up. But she was smart. She was, had the eighth grade education. But she, and I used to get mad at her. She told me something that the church taught that wasn't true. And I, I defended the church. I was a digger. I wasn't going to take that. I, 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 I could articulate, and then I had to repent because many times I was wrong. I was wrong. So I stopped looking at me, and when the first two speeches I did, with the first, out of the first five, the first few speeches I did on the radio was mankind is looking for a God he can see. I knew that people kept, I got this from the idea, we leave one church and we're looking for that charismatic man, charismatic man to go to another church. We kept looking for that man. There's no, there's no man. The one you're looking for is at the right hand of the Father. He's a spirit. And he must be worshiping spirit and in truth. And if you read chapter 19 from verse 11 all the way through verse two, chapter 20 down to chapter 21, you will see these events that's taking place before the return, at the return of Jesus Christ. The great celebration takes place in heaven. Everybody, they've been waiting on this day. They, I mean, the angels, been, Jesus didn't know. So we're going to read what Daniel said about it in a minute. This event, all this stuff happened just before the return of Jesus. There will be a carnation in heaven. And Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, therefore before me was one like a son of man, coming with clouds of, of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. And, and you know these scriptures. He was given authority. And, and he began, this is one of the first scriptures you read in the world wide, over and over again. So his dominion was forever. We used to talk about this coordination. We don't talk about it now. Can't you, can't you realize this God that has waited patiently for years is about ready to make a decision that even his son don't know when he's going to make it. So when he get ready, he's looking down there at the of us, it's going to get worse. So y'all don't have to worry about it getting better. Only thing that you can get better is you. 
You can't get nobody else better. You need to work on yourself. And everything else will work out all right. If I love you, it don't matter whether you love me or not. I'm doing my job. If I forgive you, I hope you forgive me for your sake, but that ain't going to stop me. Because I'm letting nobody take my crown. No, you're not going to take my crown. And I don't want to take yours. But there's a great event that's going to take place. And we need to get ready for it. We need to get ready. If you will read Daniel the seventh chapter, verses nine through four through fourteen, and you read Revelation nineteen one through ten, and then we'll read that one. And as this, after this, I heard was sound like a roaring of a great multitude in heaven. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Can you imagine what kind of day, what day that is? Man is on the point of totally annihilating himself. Man is not going to get any better. What he's going to get is a few of you if you obey him. That's, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for what he called? He called it the first fruit. He knows he's not going to save the world because he's not trying right now. He's looking for those people that stand the test. The greatest test that you, you know, when you first started getting tested, even before you were born, you were being, you were going to be tested. Because Satan was in the Garden of Eden. Why would God put his most precious creation in, in, in a place and then let Satan get to him? Why was Satan at the Lord's Supper, the Passover? Why? Why did God let Satan exist at all? For you to overcome your human nature and Satan is a restraining force that you got to overcome. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God is the which two you got to overcome. And any man here that got some children or any lady here that has witnessed it know. That if a person never have problems, never accept responsibility, if he, he never grow. The strongest people is the one who overcame, overcame the most obstacles. That's the truth. And we're trying to spare our kids and having a hard time. We're trying to stop them from developing. God going to put Satan down here with us to test us, but we're going to stay and run in the field for our kids. They got to overcome I'm, I'm guilty. I've been a Satan net for my kids. I was 76 and went to work again. I said, don't come here no more. I ain't getting you a dime. I'm 80 years old working. No. Something wrong. You, I don't know what your problem is, but you got to figure it out. Okay, you know, my kids are 57 and 54. And I've been a Satan net for them, the grandkids, and the great-grandkids. So I, I'm preaching something that I hadn't practiced until recently. I thought it was a good day, you know, but I wasn't. I was in the evening then. Verse 2, for true and just are his judgments, his commandments, and he has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. Jesus in Hosea, he used adultery and, and adultery is the same thing. If you, if he calls adultery, adultery to him when Israel started running after other gods. And by the way, the, the greatest sins of your nation and my nation are greatest sin. The greatest sin of America, we're the most blessed country in the world, but our greatest sin is we are given the Son God credit for what the Lord of the Sabbath has given us. If you don't believe it, look at the Washington Monument. Look at the Christmas tree every December on the Washington Capitol. Look at the East Egg Hunt. There is a national religion. And it's the Sun God religion. God calling us out of that. 
And the reason I preach like this is because I'm 80. I ain't got long. I ain't got time to play. I'm trying to make it. I'm not trying to build a social club or a following or, or, or whatever you do when you entertain them. A fan club, I don't need a fan club. I got one master. And I, I try to do what he said, and I, and I fall on my knees then sometimes. Verse 3 again, they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the living creature fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen. Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sound like a great mother tooth, like the roaring of rushing water, like loud, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! Can you see that's a celebration going on now? Can you see it? This is, this is a big event. Hallelujah! Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. If you read all of that, it, it is, it is, don't that make a little different from what's happening here? This is big. We, we, when we say wedding, a marriage, what do you think he's talking about here? He's telling you what he's talking about. He started in verse 1. You just can't pick one verse out and then tell him what he's talking about. And then skip verse 9. Where he says they are invited to the wedding. That is the Bible. I didn't make it up. That's why I printed all these out because I didn't want you to say that I made it up. Oh, that's the one that don't have a page in the moment. I got messed up there for a while. If we uh, believe Jesus, Matthew the 24th chapter, verse 42, when the Son of Man comes to save man from himself, therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at the time of night that the thief was coming in, he would have kept watch and would not have had his house broken into. So what we're doing, what he's doing in every one of these parables, he's telling us to be ready. Every one of these parables. Have the right clothes on. Don't lose connect to, to, to him, to the spirit. You know when you have bad thoughts, fall on your knees. When the world and, and please, don't get all wrapped up in this world. This is not God's world. God has prepared you to take over the world, and you can't act like the world you in. Yeah. You got to be a little different. And, and in this research that I did, to, to be right, because I got to be right, so I went way out, out the pale. I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, uh, I did, I got a lot more scriptures than I'm showing here because it'd be too boring for one thing. <laughs> the, uh, the Arabic and the Ethiopic version of this event is more in tune with my prejudice of Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2, 9 and 10. The Arabic version reads, the marriage of the Lamb has now come with his spouse prepared for him. Now I like that because it agree with me. And the Ethiopic version, the marriage of the Lamb is come and the wife is prepared. And, I, and it tells you at the bottom there where I got it from. It's not original. I, I got some reference there. But here's the good part. This is the good news. Whatever the other stuff means, this is the good news. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob look forward to New Jerusalem. 
And what, you know when you're reading and you speak a lot, and you, I don't know well, I speak a lot, things jump at you all the time. You know, I never realized until this morning, about 3 o'clock, uh, that Jacob was probably saw Abraham. I thought, I never counted the years up, but I thought that Jacob was dead when Abraham came along. And when I, when I mean, Abraham was dead when Jacob came along, it looked like me. If they traveled together, he had to be a baby or something. Uh, maybe just saying that was, the, I don't know what it was. I just thought about that. I hadn't checked it out yet. But you all got little thoughts coming through your mind, so that came through mind. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob look forward to we will we don't put enough emphasis on. Peter put it on New Jerusalem. We don't put the emphasis on that. We stop at the first thousand years. That's what this, we might go to the last great day, but that's not eternity. Eternity doesn't really start until everything is renewed and there's only spirit beings, or there's no physical being. I can tell you something else. Why come on, I want to jump ahead of the story. I'm always trying to go ahead. That's why you have notes. <laughs> so, but let me read Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelled in tents, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. So I guess if he dwelled with Isaac and Jacob, Jacob had to be alive. Their heirs were, their heirs, they, they heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city. You wouldn't be worried about what's happening every day in the news if you look for that city. If Abraham looked for it, Isaac looked for it, Jacob was looking for it, what you looking for? You wouldn't have time. That's how he could get, 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 leave his home and run around like a and sojourn. Because he didn't care. Because he was looking for that city. That's where we got to start looking. For that city. If your wife make you mad, go around the corner and pray. Come back, she be singing, you be wondering what happened to her. Same thing for the wife. You do it with your husband. <laughs> Just to pray. I used to say we would have a rough time. I said, God, I'm, going, I'm glad I did it. But I said, we was in some rough times. I said, Father, I don't care. I'm not going nowhere. You're going to have to give me the ability to endure. Cause I'm gonna stay right here, and then I get when I come back home, she be just as peaceful. But I wasn't going nowhere. I was too old, too tired, and I was married for life. And that didn't come from the church; it comes from us, from my family. Here's the good news: Hebrews 11, chapter verse 16. But now they desire a better country. You talking about the people that was in Hebrews 11. That is a heavenly. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. We all should be looking for that city. Revelation 3.12 He that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he should go no more out. I will write on him the new name, the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my new name. The writer of Hebrews either go, goes back, he goes back to what happened when God had Israel, it was at the mountain. He was going to give talk to Israel. This is what he says in Hebrews 11, 12, chapter verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that's burned with fire, to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a tempest, trumpet, and the voice of, of, of words, so that those who heard it beg for that word be spoken to them not anymore, not be spoken anymore. We always, when people are talking, I'm going to be here when Christ comes. I ain't sure. I just should have to be what Job was. Call me, call me when you're ready. I'll come, I'll come out of the grave when you tell me to, but I don't want to see all this. You think Noah wanted to see all his family die? Noah had cousins, uncles, and granddaddy and a daddy there. He witnessed all of that. 
And every, you want to you know why he drank a little wine? He was, he, was, he was like us. I would if my stomach went bad. Being a servant of God and telling the truth is not an easy job. I mean, you love human people, make them happy and tell them down shot, but to tell the truth, you're not going you're not, you know, you don't want to follow him. And listen, but you do want people to follow God, and you want to, I don't want everybody to follow God, because I want them to correct me when I'm wrong. And you know, I can't listen to the devil, he'll tell me to do anything. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that's very far, but back to Okay, I'm going to stop and I've started. For they could not endure that was commanded. And so much as a beast touches the mountain, it should be stoned, or the shot with an arrow. So terrified was the sight of that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But here's the good news. We hope, for the, I hope that everybody here can witness this moment. I, 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 this is a great moment. I want everybody to be here. Because, but you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. I want to meet you there. And I, you know, you know, I'm full of way after doing all this preaching, I don't have to make it. You could be there and I'm not making it. There's no guarantee that I'm going to make it. I got to struggle too. I got to repent too. I got to cry out to God and tell God, help me, your wretched man that I am. I'm glad Paul wrote that. If it had not be helped us. But you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to his innumerable angels, of angels, to the general assembly, the church of what? The firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood sprinkling, the sprinkling that speaks things better things than able. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where I've been headed for for the whole summer. New Jerusalem, the bride and wife of Christ. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There were no more sea. I, John, Saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared. Who prepared it? Come from God as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descended from heaven. He said, I will show you the bride. He showed him the bride. That is the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. That's not Leon Dang. I'm too pitiful. I'm pretty dumb. I'm not really. I dropped out of school in seventh grade. People made fun of me all the time I was little. So I guess God said, I'll teach you. Make fun of him or something. But you know there's a scripture in the Bible that qualifies me. <clears throat> it says he's going to take the base thing, the foolish thing, the thing that is nothing, to bring him off the things that are. So he can never boast in God's presence. I'm too pitiful to boast. I know who I am. I know where I came from. And I know my whole life is a miracle. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't, I shouldn't know what I know. God knocked the walls down for me that, that I was working in a factory at 35 and I was an engineer by the time I was 39. 
I had, bad, I had a police record, a bad army record and everything. All that was knocked out of the way. I ain't no good person. I, had a, I was a terrible childhood. I'm one of the last members of the chain game. So I'm not talking to you because I'm mighty. I'm talking to you because I'm pitiful. That's who I am. They got a song that called me Mr. Pitiful. Matthew the 21st chapter, verses 3 and 4. This is the good news again. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He would dwell with them, they would be his people. God himself should be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears. All them pains you have at night where you can't sleep in the bed, you have to sit in the chair like that. Then. God gonna get rid of all that. You don't have to worry about that. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There should be no more death. Never sorrow, not a crying, not, not, not crying. Should there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. What happened after this? Verse five. And that he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right for these words are true and faithful. All the laws of signs, as we know them, signs of belief will be changed. They believe that the universe is expanding. That when it contract, it would all, when it come out, it will all be different. Now I had a guy tell me that, one of my smart young friends at the in, in square D. And then one day I picked up the Bible and I read Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 10 through 12. And this is the father talking about his son. And in the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. They will come to an end, but you will remain forever. They would all wear out like cloth, and you would roll them up. That, don't that sound like sign? And they would be chains like cloth. But you remain the same. Your life will never end. Then we know at this moment in history, if, if, if you can call it history, because we won't have time, what we call time. So I don't know how we're going to tell time. But in 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 13, 13 Peter asks you, but keeping in with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where a righteous dwell. And Paul reminds us, but it, as it's written, I have not seen, nor have you heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that keeps his commandments, that loves him. God is prepared. For those who love him, will you play my song so I can go because I'm finished? Thank you, brother Leon. Love you, brother. Um, I, have to have a, make, I have to make a comment. I can see and feel the power of the Holy Spirit and the leading and the guiding of what happens here at the feast. And I'm going to give you a, a, a testimony of that fact. Um, and I've been seeing this since we were meeting with, at LBL over at the uh, dam. Because unlike a lot of the corporate churches, the headquarters doesn't print out a list of what subjects we have to speak about at the feast. We let the Spirit do the leading. We don't give out assignments. We don't say you have to stay within this criteria, or you have to speak about this, you have to speak about that. We let the Spirit lead when they ask, what do you want me to talk about? And Mr. Dishman will know that he's speaking tomorrow. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to teach us and to speak about. <clears throat> You consider everything that we spoke about this feast so far. You see the pattern? None of us talked beforehand about what it is that we're going to talk about other than putting it on the schedule. 
You know, my opening opening night message was what I was laid on my heart. The first seminar we did was what? Preparing the bride. The seminar this morning, what, what are we discussing? Women's role in the church. That What does that fall under? Preparing. Preparing the bride. It all fits. You can see the Spirit leading us to the things that we need to take and impart in ourselves so that we can be prepared for not only what we're about to go through, so that we can be the instruments that our Father is going to use you to be. You're not here to warm a seat. Here's we come together, we're commanded to rejoice. We're commanded, we sharpen iron together so that we can leave here and go out there or whatever our influence is and to say to a people, this is the way, walk in it. That's part of being prepared. So I just love and I'm acknowledging the spirit of our Father through his Son working in all of us to put these things together. So thank you. And uh, Todd, you're up. For closing and, in. And choir. And choir. It, uh, if you would, uh, you have, well, you really don't need a hymnal, but uh, if you do, number eight, which is, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Accept the particulars of repentance proclaimed by this, this man of God who is likely alive and well and being prepared for us in his task of pointing out your appearing. Cause us also to submit one to another as a token of our fear of God. And I pray that you would uh, cause us to be beggars in spirit who go nowhere without filling our vessels with the oil of your Holy Spirit and your name. Pour forth those ointments. Help us to go into the highways and the hedges and to bid the lame and the halt and the blind and the poor to this wedding feast. 
Please wash our robes in the very white in the blood of your Son, the Lamb of God, in order that we may be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I pray that as the twilight of this age draws near, and as the sunset of the sixth millennial day dawns on man's horizon, let us come in from the field. The sun knows it's going down, Father, but help us and our young folks to know that the sun is also setting on America. Cause us to let Elijah tell us when to come in from the field, our farms, our merchandising, because there are only six days appointed for men to work. And it will not be business as usual when that midnight cry goes forth. Thus we ask you to tune our hearts to cease soon from our own works as you ceased from yours. That, you might, that we might enter into your glorious rest. Amen. 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 So come, Lord Jesus.